I find it uh, not coincidental, but providential that every time I preach, the music, the songs that they play ties into the theme of, of what the message is going to be, so that's, that's super cool. Um, one more PSA. So this week we have Willis Tucker. Next week, the week after that, will be our final community night. Can't tell you exactly what it is, but yours truly will be cooking up some different foods than we have been experiencing this summer. So not going to tell you what that is, but you should be there. It's going to be great. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Gage. I'm one of the life group leaders here. I'm on staff as the resident. Um, uh, that's why I'm here preaching today and, and teaching, uh, which by the way, this is my third week in a row of preaching. It's a grind. Um, I'm not yet to the level of Connor and, and John and being able to put together a sermon. It's taking me like 10, 15 hours right now, um, which is a lot. But when you guys see Connor next time, just, just thank him for the work that he puts in. Although he does get paid to be a pastor, uh, he loves to do this. He loves you guys. Um, I love this. I love being here and, and worshiping with you guys and teaching and, and preaching. So the next time you see him, just, just say, give him a thank you. Uh, he's relaxing on a beach right now somewhere in Mexico. Um, so he's, he's earned that. But, uh, but yeah, I am here today because we are continuing uh, our series in the parables of Jesus. Uh, for those of you who have been here, you, you know what those are. But for those of you who are maybe joining us for the first time, uh, parables are the way in which Jesus in the New Testament uh, like to teach spiritual truths. He would share these parables for a few different reasons, um, namely revealing truths about, you know, who he was as, as the God man, the God in the flesh, uh, revealing truths about who we are in our state of humanity, um, what we're to do as followers of him, and then ultimately uh, revealing the truth about him as king of his kingdom. Uh, it tells us that he, the world, is put in subjection under Christ, that he rules and reigns from heaven. And so uh, that is right now in us as his followers and in eternity when time uh, commences and the new earth and the new heavens is ushered in. And so <clears throat> with that being said, these parables were often, uh, Jesus is speaking primarily to Jewish people. Um, and so his intent with these parables was that uh, they would be confronted. They had added to his law. They had added to God's law. They were making other people have to do the things that they've made up so that they could be a part of God's people. And ultimately, as a result of that, Jesus tells these parables and they had to make decisions. And I sometimes think about that word to decide. You have heard other words like it, like uh, fratricide or homicide or um, you know, anything that you can think of, it means to kill off something else. And so when we make a decision in our day-to-day -day lives, we are choosing not to do something. And that was the point of Jesus teaching the Jewish people. They had to decide to stop doing something and listen to Jesus and follow him or continue in their spiritual blindness to keep doing what it is that they were doing, being legalists and adding to his law. The decision for some of us today, for some of you, will be to consider who or what you are trusting in to be made right with God. Others, it will be an awareness, a conviction, maybe confession, that your trust has shifted or swayed from what it once was in God into things that can not deliver you and sustain you. Because ultimately what we'll see in this parable, you can see it up on the screen, so if you guys want to turn your Bibles there, ultimately what we'll see today is that there's only two types of people. There's those who have put their full trust in Jesus for their salvation, for their life, and then there are those that do not trust in God. They are trusting in themselves or their own works, their own righteousness, and so we're going to read the parable today, the Pharisee and the tax collector, verses, uh, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And it says this, <clears throat> He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself prayed this, 
God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than, he's speaking of the Pharisee, rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I'll pray. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity that we get to come into this place, worship you through song and now through the hearing of your word. Uh, God, like I said, there is two types of people in this room, those that have surrendered all of their efforts to be made right with you. And then there are also those that are still working in some way to please you, to make you love them. God, would you just show us who you are, what you have done and provided for us through your son, Jesus. Um, thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So as I was preparing for this message, um, I'd read this parable maybe three or four times before. And like many others, there's some misconceptions about what this parable actually is about. Uh, just right before this, uh, in Luke 18, 1, it's uh, the parable of the um, persistent widow. She goes to this judge. She's constantly, she's basically nagging him like, hey, give me, give me what I'm asking for. And it literally says like in verse one that um, he told the parable to this effect that they all, always had to pray and not lose heart. Uh, and so some have concluded myself uh, included in that, that this parable, this Pharisee and the tax collector was about prayer. And although it is about prayer, an element of prayer, it's not specifically about prayer. And then others have concluded because of the ending verse, verse 14, that it was about, you know, just be humble. God will exalt the humble. And although that is also true, that's not what this message is about. We can't manufacture humility in and of ourselves. And so um, it's not about that. It's not about prayer. It's not about being humility, although it has those elements. Because we should pray. We should be humble of heart. But the key to understanding this passage is actually the occasion for which Jesus is telling the parable. Verse 90 says, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And not only that, but they were treating others with contempt. See, those that were present, the, the Jewish people listening and likely Pharisees as well. Jesus loved to go after their theology and their, their righteousness. There were those inevitably present that were believing and trusting that they were righteous. And that's the point of the parable. They're those that were trusting in themselves. And so the people listening would have had two conclusions about the characters, the Pharisee and the tax collector. They would have come to the conclusion that the Pharisees, those are the good guys. You know, they follow the rules. They love God. They love to um, do what God has said in his, in his law. And they also would have concluded that the tax collectors, those are the bad guys. No good, not worthy of, their love, of God's love, not able to be a part of his family. The other kind of funny part is that earlier in, in the book of Luke, chapter 7, it says, he was, they're speaking of Jesus, was said to be a friend of sinners and tax collectors. So as Jesus is speaking this parable, he's really not helping himself in the eyes of his listeners because he's talking about a Pharisee, he's talking about a tax collector, and he was notorious for hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. And so these listeners are probably thinking to themselves, like, what's this guy going to say now? He's claimed to be God, and now he's said he can forgive sins, which only God can do. He's, he's blasphemous. And these Pharisees, I know we've, we hear of Pharisees, you know, that person is acting like a Pharisee. But really in this time, they were called to be separated. That's literally what Pharisee means is separated ones. And they popped up during the time of the conclusion of the Old Testament and Jesus arriving on the scene. Like I said, they loved the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not. They loved that stuff. They were diverse. Some of them were part of the priesthood if they were Levites. But they weren't totally united on all things. But what they were united on was that they loved for others to see their external righteousness or the actions that they would take. Matthew 23, verses 2 through 7, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. 
So, Jesus is telling his listeners, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do the works that they do, for they preach, but do not practice. It's called hypocrites. They tie up burdens, they, they're hard to bear, they lay them on people's shoulders, but the Pharisees, they're not willing to move with their fingers. They do all the deeds to be seen by others, they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, their robes, and they love the places of honor at feasts and the seats at, in the synagogues. They love greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi or teacher by others. To the Jews, these Pharisees were the good guys, comparatively speaking. None of them, nobody was more righteous than the Pharisees. They, nobody could please God in their, in their estimation more than the Pharisees. Problem is, we're not, compared to call ourselves, com, we're not called to compare ourselves to others. We, as humans, are called to compare ourselves to God and his standard. Again, the Ten Commandments. The Pharisees use this law, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments as a weapon when its intent, its purpose is to be a mirror. It's to show us who we are in relation to this holy God and as a result, see our need for his mercy, his forgiveness. And that's not what they did. It, that's not what they did with this. They used it as a weapon to hurt people, to exclude people. But then we have the tax collector. These guys were thugs. They were the modern day mafia. They're employed by the Roman enemies. They were seen as extortioners, as the Pharisee called him. Because what they could do is, uh, during the Roman occupation, they could tax the, the Jewish people. Let's say the tax was 10%. It was probably more. I didn't look that deep into it. But let's say they taxed them 10%. Well, these tax collectors could say, well, I'm going to charge them 11, 12, 13, 14, 15%. And I'm going to keep that extra off the top. So they were rich. It says that when Jesus calls Matthew, who is called Levi, he had great parties and had all the prostitutes and the sinners that would come and hang out. Jesus was present. So they live lavish lives. They love to be rich. But they were oppressors to their own people. And because of that, they were Jewish by descent. Because of that, they were considered outcasts. They were outside any saving. They were outside any ability for God to love them or save them. And what's even more kind of funny about this parable is the tax collectors typically wouldn't be the ones sitting in the temple. But Jesus says, these two men went up to the temple to pray. And on this day, we're going to find out why. And our main idea for this message is that we, humans, are all in need of God's mercy. Because reality is, it says, the people listening... They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They wanted to do good things for God. They wanted to do the righteous things. They were just doing it for the wrong reasons, just like the Pharisees. They loved for other people to see their righteousness displayed. Some of you may be wondering, like, okay, like, I've heard righteousness. I kind of understand. I didn't. What makes a thing righteous or something good? There's kind of a simple way to think of this. It's a good thing or a right thing done in the right way for the right reason or intent. Here's an example. Feeding the homeless. I know some of you have probably seen on social media those people that, you know, I'm going to go give this homeless person 5,000 bucks or 1,000 bucks. But what do they do? They video themselves doing it. It's a good thing. You know, good, give money to the poor. They're, doing it, they're not doing it in the right way. And they're definitely not doing it for the right reason. They're doing it for self-exaltation, for others to see so they can get those likes, those clicks. And this is the entire issue of the Bible, if you think about it. It's the issue of righteousness, right? God is holy, right? He's perfect, he's just, and we are not. And so the question becomes, how does one be made right, or how is one justified in the sight of this holy God? My hope and my prayer is that by the end of this message is that we had been moved, hopefully changed, to abandon all thoughts, all desires of trying to work ourselves to God. Because the truth is we can't do it. It's bad news. And that's our point one for today. We cannot justify ourselves. Say it in another way, we can't make ourselves right with God. 
Verse 14 says, this man, referring to the tax collector, went to his house justified. Romans 4, 2 through 5, it says this, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So there's that faith. Now to the one who works, those are those who try to work, themselves, work themselves to God, his wages or his payment are not counted as a gift, but it's his due. If you try to work yourselves to God, you have to keep working and keep working and keep working. Verse 5 says, but to the one who does not work but believes, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, speaking of God, his faith, that is what is counted as righteousness. So we see time and time again, it is those who try to work themselves to God that are exhausted, they're hopeless, depressed, anxious, but this is what our God does. He justifies the ungodly, the perfect judge declaring sinners, us, righteous in his divine courtroom. And now some of you are also thinking to yourselves, how can that be? If I commit a crime, let's say you guys are driving, you have cell phones. If you were to go through a school zone and hit a kid while you're texting on your phone, you show up to the court date, the judge says, hey, you broke the law. And your response is, yeah, but I get good grades. I'm a good kid. I don't get in trouble at school. I made a mistake. The good judge would say, okay, that's, that's nice, but you still broke the law. And a good, perfect judge would sentence you in that moment. So how does God, a even more perfect and more holy judge, allow us to be made clean, to be forgiven? Because most of us know that we have no ability in ourselves to achieve this righteousness that God demands and requires. But we, as followers of Jesus, we possess the righteousness of Christ. We just sang about it. We get to come boldly, pure and holy, because we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. Second Corinthians says that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is, that is the good news. That is the, the response to, okay, if we can't work ourselves, then how do we become righteous? That's, that's the gospel. It's Jesus on the cross exchanges his perfectness, his righteousness in exchange for our sin so that one day when we do stand before God, because it, in the song we just sang, it says, when I think of your promise that will stand before you, we will stand before God, but he won't see our sin. He will, he will see the perfect righteousness of Jesus that we did not earn, that we did not deserve, and it will go on and on and on. It will never end. And that's great news. This means that we're made righteous by God in the sight of God. We're accepted by God, right? Because it's one thing to be forgiven, but now we have to be perfect. And so there's, this, there's a situation on the cross where, again, Jesus takes our sin, but he also gives us his righteousness. It's called the great exchange, as some, would, as some have called it. Because on the cross, Jesus was treated as if he were the sinner, as if he had broke the law like we had, even though he was perfect and holy and pure. And unjustly, even though God made it so, we are treated as if we are righteous on account of what Jesus has done on our behalf. We are treated as if we actually fulfilled every single point of the law. And there was a lot, like a lot of points that we would have had to fulfill. And even then, we still don't become exposed to its penalty, God's wrath and justice. We have received, not attained, the unattainable gift, the righteousness of God. For some of you, you've come in here from other faith backgrounds. This, this doctrine, this issue of justification is where the line gets drawn between biblical Christianity, true faith, and all the other world religions. Mormonism Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, even Judaism, all of those religions, they require you on some subjective scale of righteousness to work your way to do more good than bad so that you can have favor and a right relationship with God. And again, that's exhausting. How do I know if I've done more good than bad? Are you keeping score? You keeping tallies of, I gave to the poor, I, I didn't cheat on my test, I, I didn't lie to my parents, God shows us that we are incapable of doing that 
and actually in reverse works his way down to us. Jesus becomes the God man, leaves his throne in heaven and becomes Emmanuel, God with us. We also know this because Acts 4.12 tells us that there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Not Brahmin, not the Pope, not Allah, not Buddha. And honestly, when I heard that for the first time, I didn't like it. I love to do. I love to do good things now. But if we're honest, it removes any hope, any, any uh, ability for us to, to compare ourselves to another, which we honestly like to do, if we're being honest. Sophomore in college, I, uh, <clears throat> I was asked to give a testimony on behalf of another person. They were here on a green card for like 15, 20 years. And they asked, uh, I was asked to give a testimony on why this person should not be deported back to Mexico. This person had broken the law and it had finally caught up to them. And I had just honestly had a relationship with this person for like three years maybe at this time. So I didn't really have like a good knowledge of this person. I didn't really know their character. I knew what they had done. I knew what they were guilty of. But I had nothing to point to to say, judge, you should let this person stay in this country because of X, Y, or Z. All this person had was to plead for the mercy of the judge. That's all I had. I said, honestly, judge, like you could let him go. It's not going to hurt me much. I barely knew this person. But all this person had, their testimony was, I met God in this place. I'm a changed man. I promise not to do or break the law anymore. Knowing that that's a lie. Don't ever make that promise. God, I promise this is the last time. Don't do that. That's that's us trying to manufacture our own righteousness. It doesn't work. I've, I've I've tried it hundreds of times. But we couldn't point to anything that this person deserved to stay in this country. Luckily, fortunately, thankfully, this judge did show mercy. And so my kids have a grandfather. I have a dad. Um, Only because the mercy of this judge. And so we get to see that Jesus, that's what he's talking about here. We only have the hope that God would be merciful to us. And he shows himself in that. Again, he provides us the grace and mercy that we absolutely need. Then we fortunately get a farther look into the heart of the Pharisee through his prayer. This one got me good. He, uh, Pharisee starts off, God, I thank you. Should have stopped there because he would have been on good, uh, good terms. That's a great way to start a prayer. God, I thank you. Psalm 100 tells us we enter his thanks with thanksgiving We enter his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. This Pharisee would have known that. And so out of his self-righteousness, he would have started his prayer with God, I thank you. Problem is, and I, again, I've done this myself. We don't really consider what we would be often if it weren't for the grace of God in our lives. And we for sure know the Pharisee didn't do this. He didn't consider who or what he would be had not it been for the grace of God giving him the law. But he didn't compare himself to the law. He compared himself to others. He points to the tax collector. At least I'm not like that guy. He starts commending himself for what he's not doing, right? I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Things that a tax collector would have been. Remember, he's rich, so he can afford the prostitutes. He can afford the parties. He's pointing to his morality, his own goodness. And then he commends himself for what he does do. I fast twice a week and I give 10% or tithes of all that I have. This is Jesus in his all-knowing wisdom. He's elevating this Pharisee to his Jewish listeners to show them how much none of that stuff matters if his heart or our hearts are in the wrong place. Because then he condemns him. Can't say he condemns him to hell because he could have repented later on, but The parable doesn't say that. He condemns him, says he's not justified. That would have been a shocker to these listeners. Like, man, this Pharisee does all this. And Jesus just said, he's not justified. He's not right with God. What hope do we have? Well, our hope is that we're humble. That's point two. 
It's the humble who God justifies. Another way, God is merciful to the humble. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, uh, we have the tendency to do the same when we don't consider who we would be or what we would do if it weren't for God's intervening grace in our lives. I unfortunately had the misfortune to be without God's saving grace for 26 years of my life. I had been inside more courtrooms than I'm proud to admit. And it would be, <clears throat> again, if we don't consider that, we are actually like the Pharisee. We, be, we begin to commend ourselves. We'll start pointing to our own morality, our own religious habits. It sounds like this. At least I don't do X, Y, or Z. I know what this person who calls himself a Christian does. I know them, and I don't do that, so I'm good with God. We point to our religious works. I come to church. I get good grades. I don't disobey my parents or my teachers. I don't get in trouble or hang out with the wrong crowd. Those are all things that we have either said or do say. And it's only in an effort to make ourselves worthy to feel good enough that we're good with God. But then we get a look into the heart of the tax collector. His posture, where he's at, his positioning in the temple is very different from the Pharisees. And this is because he knows he's guilty. He knows that he's worthy of God's judgment and wrath. And he has no right to be close to God. This is why he positioned himself in the way he did. Old Testament times, if you've read you know, uh, Genesis through Numbers or Deuteronomy, Leviticus, uh, it talks about the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the people had to stay outside of that because of how holy God was. He was physically present in the tabernacle inside the Holy of Holies. And that would eventually come true in, in when the temple was built in Jerusalem. You'd have the outer courts where the women and the really unclean, the sinners would hang out. Because if they got too close, they'd be afraid that God would just smite them dead. And on the inside, the inner courts, the Holy of Holies where God's presence was, presence was supposed to be residing that's where the really clean, the get it all together people, the, the priests would go in and meet with God. And so this tax collector has positioned himself far off. And these actions that, he, that, that were being shown, it's in congruence with how he views himself in relation to God, not other people. And it says he beat his breast. We see this in the Bible only one other time. It's when Jesus just dies on the cross in Luke, uh, Luke 23. It says, all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. And this action, the language that's used in, in the Greek, it represents sorrow and distress and regret. Now, this doesn't mean we start coming in here just beating our breasts like, oh, God, we're sorry. That'd be weird. But this man, this, this tax collector, he's broken. He's broken over his sin. He is distressed because all he has to hope in is that God shows him mercy. Not only for truly the sinner that he was, but for all he was doing to God's very own people. Extorting them, treating them unjustly. And the tax collector's prayer is really the closest thing we see in the Bible to what many of you heard called the sinner's prayer. The only difference is that no one's leading him in this. No one's coming alongside him. There's nothing wrong with that. But no one's coming alongside of him saying, hey, this is what you have to say to get right with God. What's actually happened is he's been confronted. He's met and been in the presence of God. And God in his mercy has shown him his hopeless state. And all he can do is plead for God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's confession, it's repentance all wrapped up into a very simple prayer. And God does what he does best and he forgives. He makes new. We know this man was saved because God said he is justified. And once you're justified, you cannot become unjustified. That would be unjust. That's not God. 
tax collector is not thinking about others, pointing to others like the tax or the Pharisee is. He's not looking at others. It's almost as if he sees himself as the only sinner in the temple at this point. And that's how we should see ourselves. We don't need to worry about our friends, what they're doing. Although we encourage them and as a loving friend, you know, we may call out their sin. Again, remembering that before we do that, we better make sure that we're not committing the same kind of sin in the same way, right? Take the log out of your eye. But that's how we should see ourselves personally, not worrying about anyone else. Some of you are going to get married. You're going to have a spouse. You're going to have kids. My, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, you, it's very easy to see and point out other people's sin when you live in close proximity, when you spend a lot of time with them. This is something I struggle with early on in my marriage, whether explicitly or not. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all this Bible reading. Like, what is my wife doing? She's in here. She didn't know I was going to say that. But it's very easy to see it in others before we see it in ourselves. So some of you may be asking, how do we know if we are exalting ourselves, like verse 14 says? How do we, when, what are the signs, what are the indicators? There's a few that I found and could come up with that would be simple to evaluate ourselves with. First is that you think you're good enough to earn God's forgiveness or favor. It's very simple, very explicit. And again, we may not say that to ourselves, like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to earn God's forgiveness or favor, but through our actions or how we go about our relationship with God, it would be easy to see. But again, when God sees us, he sees Christ's righteousness, not the kind we think we have or that we can manufacture up. The second way is, <clears throat> this, was, this was me, second way is you think it takes more to save others than it does to save you. You may say to yourself, again, that person does so-and-so, I know them, I know the sin that they commit, so they need more mercy than I do. The reality is, Although our sin has different ramifications, different consequences, right? If we kill somebody, there's obviously more consequences than if we cheat on our homework or we watch porn or gossip about someone in our class. But in God's sight, in God's sight sin is sin and it must be dealt with. So you think it takes more to save others than it would to save you. Third way, you're trusting in yourself and treating others with contempt and judgment. This is that scenario of, hey, I'm doing all of these things and they are not. Therefore, God doesn't love them as much as he loves me. Or they don't know God because if they did, they would be doing the same things I'm doing. Paul calls that dung. He calls it rubbish. Point three. We have to reject self-righteousness. Put another way, we don't have to earn God's love. That's great news. Steve, Pastor Steve always says, there's nothing that we can make, there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us more. And that is 100% true. I hope you hear that in this message. I hope that sinks in. I hope it you ponder it as you go about your day today. So we get to a point of application. I know it's hypothetical, but it's very important. I think about this all the time, not because I'm uncertain about my salvation, but because I want to examine myself and make sure that I am doing what it is God would have me do. But if you were to die tonight and you were standing before God, why should he let you in? He says, why should I let you in to heaven? If our answers start with I, right? Example, I repented. I went to church. I don't do bad stuff. I, I, I think of whatever you can think of. There's a small chance. I'm not saying it's absolute. There's a small chance you might be trusting in yourself. This was the difference between the Pharisee pointing to himself at all the things he was or wasn't doing versus the tax collector. All he could do was point to God. God, have mercy on me. Luke 5, 30 through 32 says this about Jesus, or Jesus is saying this. He says, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat with 
and drink with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus answered to them, you guys have probably heard this, those who are well, they have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but call sinners to repentance. Typically, sinful people, those that are living in sin or are enslaved by their sin, they don't rush to the presence of God. They flee from it. There's been multiple times in my walk with God that I feel far from God. I get the sense that he doesn't love me because of what I've done or haven't done. I don't rush to God, and that's because I didn't have a proper understanding of this, this justification. It's by faith alone. Now, obviously, if you've confessed Christ and you say, yeah, I I trust him, I believe him, that's great. It's amazing. Praise God. But then James tells us that if our faith is not accompanied with with good works, we have have reason to doubt that that faith is, is real, that it's a saving trusting faith. So if that's you, if you feel far from God as a believer, if you feel that sense that I'm just not, not feeling it, God, just do what the tax collector did. Go back to God, ask for his mercy. He's faithful. It says, he who is faithful, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We all need God's mercy. It's the bad news. We, we actually need his mercy. The good news is that God is willing to, and able to supply us with what we need through Jesus. If we seek him with a humble heart and work to reject our own self-righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that hopefully hearing these words from your word, that we can let go of trying to be good enough, do more, act right, that we would just trust you, God, that you have done what it is that you said you've done. You've given us Christ. You see his righteousness as we seek to follow you. We don't have to worry about what we did in our past or what we, you know, the things that we think are unforgivable. God, would you give us humble hearts Create in us that clean heart that David says. Renew the right spirit in us. For those of those in you in this room, God, would you give them the sense that you're waiting for them to come back, that you're willing to forgive them, to give them a fresh start today, this week, this month. God, we thank you that you are who you say you are, that you've done all the hard work. We no longer have to work for your love, that you love us perfectly and that you see true righteousness because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. All right, we got done a little early, so if you guys could hang out in the student center for another five minutes or so, uh, that would be great. Thank you, guys.